So what I'd like you to do is add the quotation marks to Christianity. I should have done that. Obviously, I don't mean how Christianity, the real true Christianity, banned Christ. I, I obviously, in this crowd, by that I mean, do you have me in the camera? By that I obviously mean the orthodox system we all loathe by now. I hope you've all been converted, right? They're the enemy, we're good. The, all right, so yeah, so that's a hand that, that's more of a, this is more of a statistical thing if you've seen it, but I'm gonna flesh it out a little bit. But this is more for your information. So the point of this conference, I hope, is that we take all these talks and equip the saints, us, and go forth and conquer and destroy the, uh, as Paul says in Ephesians, the, the towers, the walls, and so on of uh, the, the devil. Destroy arguments, not people. We destroy arguments. There's a difference between arguments and human beings. We don't touch them. <laughs> The arguments deserve them, Dr. Dale. So that's what we do, and hopefully this, will, this is just to equip us. Uh, and I'll give you some things here, some information as Anthony said. It's really hidden history. I don't mean to be corny or, uh, you know, uh, what's the word? Uh, sorry? Conspiracy? Yeah, it's, but it, it really is. It, it is a conspiracy. It is a... Uh, a bandage that uh, a lot of people don't know. The information here is amazing because it's things that even rabbis, Jews, practicing Jews, don't even know about their own history, which I find incredible. So let's begin. So, or how paganism agrees with Christianity. So this is how Christianity banned Christ, or how paganism agrees with Christianity, I'm playing on the Dr. Strangelove, or how, or how I Learned to Love the Atomic Bomb. I don't know if you, 1962, I wasn't born, but it's a great classic movie. So I'll give you an outline. The outline is simple, history. History informs us, history is key, uh, and we'll see how history repeats itself, the old uh, saying. We'll look at the Shema versus the Trinity, which is really what this comes down to. And I'll give you a little bit of uh, nerdy uh, textual analysis. I hope it's not too nerdy. And three, so what? So, okay, cool. You got a bunch of stats here. All right, you got N.T. Wright. Oh, he's cool, N.T. Wright. Right? You got, you got Greek stuff in, on this paper. Kyrios Monos. Oh, that sounds learned. And you got a bunch of quotes in the back. So what? How is this going to help me, my neighbor, my community, and most importantly, the Great Commission work? Well, guess what? You will be made to care. That's a, I swiped that for the camera and the audience out there, the two billion viewers. By the way, two billion people are, we're streaming live. <laughs> two billion. That's uh, Eric Erickson, he's a local Georgia radio guy. Uh, he made that famous, I don't know if it's his, but you will be made to care, he's a political guy. All right, so let's look at uh, history, okay. The Greco-Roman Roman ban, and I have Danny, and I have Pastor Seth to help me out here for my throat gets. Uh, Danny, please. From the sources in general, it is clear that Rabbi Akiva died because of his insistence on saying the Shema prayer at the proper time. It should be noted that the Roman authorities did not ban prayer in general, only the Shema. It would appear that this ban was made because of the stress in the Shema on the unity of God, which inherently denies the existence of other gods and can be seen as damaging to the concept of the divinity of the emperor. Hadrian indeed placed exceptional stress on the cult of the emperor. I love scholars. It would appear, right? I love that. So this is a book on religious responses to political crises. 
uh, editors are there, page 1160. This, uh, I, I hope this is standard information, right, that the Greco-Roman world, the pagan world, didn't like the Shema, right? And we know why, it's pretty simple. Uh, hold on. And this information, by the way, uh, the following information can be also obtained in Reeves. Uh, did Calvin murder Servetus? That's actually a free online book that you can get on Google Books. So just type in, uh, it's an incredible book by this California lawyer. He's a lawyer. I don't know if he's really religious or a believer, but he found out that Christians were killing Christians. So he wrote this massive tome but it's real good historical information. So you got the Greco-Roman ban, and it mentioned uh, Rabbi Akiva, for those of you who do not know, Rabbi Akiva is, is a famous Jewish martyr of the second sort of temple period or around that time. And there are various stories about how great he was, uh, you know, all this almost uh, lore, mythical stuff that builds around historical people because they made an impact on a lot of people were emotionally invested in, on these individuals. So other stuff, uh, they embellish a lot of the stories. Uh, so that was Danny, Seth, Pastor, can you read the Talmud there, please? The hour when <coughs> Rabbi Akiva was led out to his execution was a time for reciting the Shema. Even whilst the Romans were combing his flesh with iron combs, he recited the words with which a Jew takes upon himself the yoke of the kingdom of heaven. His disciples said to him, Our master, you go so far? He said to them, All my life I have been troubled by the verse, With all your soul, Deuteronomy 6, 5, which means even at the cost of one's life. I said to myself, When shall I ever be able to fulfill that commandment? Now that opportunity has been given to me, shall I not fulfill it? He prolonged his saying, Hachad, until, finally, he died with the word one upon his lips. Hard. Uh, it's, uh, obviously, this is an embellishment. Uh, if you're getting your flesh combed with iron, uh, whatever, uh, I don't think he'll be saying all that. But he was martyred, uh, prob probably very horribly. The Romans were, you know, savage, uh, according to our uh, standards, although ISIS is giving them a run for their money. But uh, there you have it, so that's the reference there. Uh, so now an interesting thing. So we had a pagan ban, a Greco-Roman ban, and guess what I found? Uh, and I had to dig and dig. And I, this is a bit incomplete because I am sure there are Christian sources. So I'm, now I'm gonna go into sixth, seventh century AD, uh, Byzantine Empire history. And I'm sure there are Christian sources, but I couldn't find any. So it's a bit incomplete. But this is a, a great book, Jewish Worship, Milligram. Uh, Danny, could you? The Jews' vociferous recitation of the Shema at each morning and evening service was, the church felt, a deliberate challenge to the Christian dogma of the Trinity. Justinian thus struck at the heart of Jewish worship by, ex by excising, excising the Shema. The Kedusha was condoned because Christians saw in the threefold sanctification of God, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, a hint of the Trinity. The ban lasted until the Muslims overran the country in 637. This is history. Th this is actually quoted by Let's see, how many sources did I look, like, look at? Six, seven historians? Uh, th this is an amazing story. Uh, so the, uh, it's incredible, the last statement, Muslims. <laughs> so Palestine, uh, ancient Palestine, what's modern day parts of modern day Israel, the nation of Israel, came under, uh, it was first Persian, so you're talking 4th, 5th century Persian rule. Uh, they banned the Shema, right? Persians, those stinking pagans. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then Christians come in. 
quote-unquote Christians come in in the form of Byzantine Christians. So you're talking Justinian, Theodosian, right? Well, some of you might know those names, emperors. Uh, and guess what they do? They follow the Persian ban. Why? Now, we saw the first quote, religious persecution, why the pagans were doing it. Why are the Christians following pagans in Benin the Shema? <laughs> it's, it's an incredible thing. So I asked actually um, uh, a Jewish source, uh, this guy, the uh, Karite Jew, I forget his name. Nehemiah Gordon, uh, he's very well known online. A lot of uh, Christians like him because he's a Jew, as they do. Uh, but even Nehemiah Gordon, who's a very well-educated, uh, is he a rabbi? Uh, I, I'm, I don't think he's an official rabbi, but even he didn't know about this. That because of the Christian ban, they, they had to, they, those Jews, 6th, 7th century, had to hide the Shema in other Jewish prayers called, one was called the Kedusha. To, to continue their allegiance to, to the unipersonal God of Abraham, Isaac, Moses. Incredible. Let's see. So why is this happening? So let's go to the textual analysis. God is one person. So you have the Shema in Greek. So your New Testament, your New Testament authors loved the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, known as the Septuagint, or the LXX, stands for the 70, because tradition says that 70 rabbis got together circa 3rd, 2nd BC, and translated the Hebrew scriptures. So you have Kyrios Oteos, Emon Kyrios Is Estin. Now I'm just, I'm not just reading to sound, uh, you know, scholarly, I'm not a scholar, internet. I'm just, but I'm going to make a point about the Greek there, Isestin especially. So the Lord our God is one Lord, you know, usual translation. You can paraphrase that as Anthony will in his second edition to his commentary. He will paraphrase it. You have promised me. As the Lord our God is one person. Okay. Uh, who's, you re, uh, Pastor, you're next. Reading? <laughs> yeah. There you go. <laughs> the great Samuel Clark writes that the one, Greek is, describing God here means just one person. And furthermore, the scribe's response in Mark 12, 29, following, uses the singular he, does not mean no other than his substance, but personally, <laughs> no other than he. So let's see, you know, one and one equals... One and one and one equals one in some formulations, but to us, the, the one and one and one equals three. Well, obviously, what's going on here? So the Shema in Greek, especially, uh, you know, even in Hebrew, obviously, but I'm focusing on Greek because we're Christians. New Testament uh, inspired scripture is in Greek. So obviously, the Shema is, speaks of one person. So why would this be offensive to Byzantine Christians and pagans? Because you got one person, that is God, or who is God, I should say. So this is uh, Chandler, the guy over there, and uh, he, he must buy or, or win his book. It's, it's excellent. So uh, John 1030 is interesting. The Father and I are one, and there it's N in Greek, the NET Bible. N is neuter, not masculine, so the assertion is not that Jesus and the Father are one person, but one thing. This is interesting to me, because evangelical scholars, NET Bible, among them is uh, Daniel Wallace, a contributor to that translation slash paraphrase. It's more of a paraphrase than that Bible. They recognize this rule of Greek New Testament grammar, okay? that whenever N appears, such as in that verse, obviously it's N, it's not is, which is one, right? Because the Father and the Son, Jesus, 
they're not one person, obviously. That would be modalism. Even Trinitarians uh, argue against that, although some, as Dell noted, teach uh, uh, modalism. But it's obviously a different word, which is this N word, okay? Metzger says the same thing. Uh, Danny, could you? In the, mac in the masculine, east must be distinguished from the neuter N. East means one numerically. Had John 10, 30 said east, it would have meant one person. Perfect Greek, by the way. Mm. All right, great. <laughs> uh, Raymond Brown, from earliest times, it has been observed that Jesus says, I and the Father are N, i.e., one in action, not in person. So I just want you to see the sheer hypocrisy here, <laughs> okay? You're not gonna find these footnotes in Mark 12, 29. That's, that's the point here. You're not gonna find these footnotes whenever one God appears in the formulation, whenever is esteen appears, and I'll show you that phrase as well, or kyrios is, you, you're not gonna find that, but you will find it in a verse that oneness, for example, oneness Pentecostals love, they love John 10, 30, right? Because they interpret it as, oh, there, John, uh, sorry, the Father and I are one, one person, right? Jesus is the Father. That's a modalist or oneness view, right? But these are evangelical people, Net Bible, Metzger, famous Bruce Metzger and Raymond Brown. So it's, a, it's hypocritical to say the least. That phrase there is very important. Is esteen, this is the phrase in the Shema in Greek, right? So what are we looking at here? Thayer, uh, who was a Unitarian, Anthony? Yeah. Thayer, yep. So they might say, oh, you're using a Unitarian scholar. Well, we'll see others. Where the word is takes the place of a predicate, it means one person, like in the Shema. That's why Anthony will uh, seek my advice and paraphrase in your second edition. Uh, Deuteronomy 6.4 LXX, the Septuagint Greek, the translation, the Lord is one, right? That's the Greek of Deuteronomy 6.4, right? The Septuagint. Kyrios is esteem, right? Uh, Mark 12, 32, guess what? It appears there, same formulation, same phrase, phraseology, is that right? Is esteen, Galatians 3, 20, that's Paul. So we're, we're going, uh, who wrote Deuteronomy? Moses? Who wrote Mark? Mark. <laughs> who wrote Galatians? And what? Moses wrote this in, what's that? Galatians wrote Galatians. <laughs> Galatians, wrote Galatians for the camera. Uh, so we're looking, and, and chronologically, it's thousands of years apart, right? Three different authors, and they all concur, right? They all believe that the, the God of the Jews and the God of Christians is the same, right? James, who wrote James? James. Galatians. <laughs> Galatians, someone said. <laughs> Same deal, God is one. He says, Tin Oteos, just in case, says James. Just in case, I'm talking about the one person of the God. Oteos is the God, right, literally. And note, uh, as Anthony noted, uh, the Nash Papyrus, second century BC, actually paraphrased the Shema as the Lord, He is one. What's that remind us of? 1232, right? He is one Lord, okay? So I'm just showing you here why, why would Christians in the sixth and seventh have issues with the Shema? If Jesus recited the Shema, actually, what did Jesus say? The first and greatest of the commandments. Actually, the Jewish rabbi testing Jesus, right? Uh, code word, I also found this interesting. So you have... One God, is uh, Theos. Is that right, Anthony? One God, is Theos. Neufeld, uh, earliest Christian confessions. Who's next in the reading chain? Uh, Pastor Seth? It's a long one. <laughs> <laughs> in addition to the Shema, and perhaps in some cases as a substitute for it, one finds that at the beginning of the Christian era, the formula 
Eso Theos, was used to express the monotheistic faith of Judaism. The currency of this confession in the Jewish world of that time is clearly demonstrated by the widespread evidence Judaism made inroads into paganism, and at least one of the reasons for the remarkable success of Jewish propaganda was the fact that its unique faith in one God alone was a rational one in contrast with the confusion of polytheism. Strabo was attracted to the Jewish idea of the one divine being and the refusal to portray him by images. That's interesting. I didn't know about that, about that Strabo reference there. Uh, so, yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting thing, isn't it? So whenever a Jew in Second Temple period, the time of the Apostolic Age, first century AD, even, even into second century AD, so East Dales was code. Uh, I, I say that's my addition. It's a code, right? So you don't, get, you don't have to go Skidios Hotels, Skidios East Estine, right? They, no, they go East Dales, right? Code word. Uh, by the way, the New Testament uses a lot of code language, as Anthony has observed, with, you know, uh, code for the gospel being the word, the seed, and so on. So we know Jews are accustomed, and then Jewish Christians take it up, are accustomed to a form of code language, right? So that's interesting. Uh, so we should not make exceptions to the rule, right? In life, usually, you don't make exceptions to uh, your rule or else we'll probably be in jail for not paying taxes or something. Uh, so look at this. Uh, now this just stats, nerdy, nerdy stats. In the New Testament, the word God, look at this, equals the Father. I'm using Bible Works uh, 9, 99.5% of the time. You might find it higher in another software, I'm sure. Uh, hence, for Paul, of course, the Father is God par excellence, 30 plus times I found uh, with my count. A hot does not, that's a unequal sign, is that what that's called? <laughs> An unequal sign. Uh, does not, guess what? Compound one or complex unity, and that's against Michael Brown, the big messianic out there in internet land, <laughs> who's a Jew of the flesh, and people believe him because, hey, he's a Jew. He knows, right? <laughs> Uh, so that's against him. Uh, just a little information here about this compound one thing so you can take home and it's in the paper there. Just because the noun modified by hot may be collective, for example, one family, right? So the family there, one team, it doesn't mean one, the hot word, or is in Greek, a hot in Hebrew, one. In Greek is is, right? Uh, doesn't mean one means more than one, yet, even when one describes a noun, the noun being team or family, the word one retains its singular meaning, i.e. never more than one. So, when I say one team, how many teams? One. 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 So, why? Because it does, uh, the noun is not modifying the numeral one. If I say I have one family, are you gonna say, oh, you're a Mormon, you got three. No, no, I hope not. <laughs> no, you, you got one family. I get you. Uh, Waller, is that right, Anthony? Waller, German name there. Nice German name. The Shema and the First Commandment. By the way, I advise uh, you, you check out those books if you want to learn more about this. Uh, Danny, please. The Septuagint uses the term east and not mono, indicating that the translator understood Echad in a numerical sense. Wow, it took, uh, uh, this is a, like a 400 page tome, and that was like about the best quote I got <laughs> from, the, you gotta go, you know, this is gold digging stuff, what we do, right? Uh, you gotta really dig. But there I found it, a good quote. Uh, common sense, right? Uh, let's see, so continue the textual analysis here. So now let's look at the other team. Not the other two teams, the other one team. Three persons, uh, this is for Professor Tuggy here. The Athanasian Creed, uh, Pastor Seth, please. We worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance. For there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, another of the Holy Ghost, 
the whole three persons are co-eternal together and co-equal. He, therefore, that will be saved must thus think of the Trinity, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> You're supposed to shout that last part. <laughs> See, it's yeah. all caps. Yeah. Where is it? He, therefore, that will be saved. Right. Uh, that's quite extraordinary, right? Uh, note, while the creed, while this creed, Athanasian creed, has always been attributed to Saint Athanasius who died around that time. It was unknown in the Eastern churches until the 12th century. Uh, that's interesting, right? So they're working off, this is, this information is from a Catholic website, a Catholic website. <laughs> Why? Because the older the better. Well look, this, what are you on about the Trinity is false? 325. But as uh, Professor Tuggy will attest to, 325 was really a binitarian creed they came out with. Really, if you look at it. And maybe not even. Say it's binitarian. What would you say it was? Unitarian with confused language. Unitarian with confused language. My point being, it's not Trinitarian. 325, but they're all, all the people out there, no, 325 settled it. What are you on about? It settled, 325. So the older the better, and this creed, which is really the trinity we have today, the so-called Athanasian, it's really, uh, yeah, 1,200. I've read some books that say that the Catholic Church didn't, uh, didn't uh, how can I put this, enforce it until 1,000 AD. Because we only find it in, in disparate areas in Spain and France at, at uh, this formulation, right? So it's quite incredible. Moving on here, uh, so he is the immortal one, Athanasius, that's what it means, right? It's a Greek uh, word there, meaning no death. Who's next in the readings? Uh, Danny, a defense of the Nicene definition. So this is uh, Athanasius, now this is attributed to him. I th we pretty much believe historians think he did write this. Go ahead. I marveled at the affrontery which led the Arians to complain like the Jews. Why did the fathers at Nicaea use terms not in scripture of the essence and one in essence? Now such endeavors are nothing else than an obvious token of their defect of reason and a copying of Jewish malignity. Go ahead. As then the Jews of that day for acting thus wickedly and denying the Lord were with justice deprived of their laws and of the promise made to their fathers, the gospel. So the Arians, Judaizing now, are like Caiaphas and the contemporary Pharisees. Good. But you, O modern Jews and disciples of Caiaphas, how many fathers can you assign to your praises? Not one, for all abhor you, but the devil alone. None but he is your father in this apostasy, who both in the beginning sowed you with the seed of this irreligion, and now persuade you to slander the ecumenical council. This man has come down in history as Saint Athanasius. Saint Athanasius, Athanasius, a, a church father, okay? It's quite incredible that quote, uh, the more you look at it, you know, when you do papers and stuff, you go through this stuff a lot, but uh, so the Jews complained at Nicaea, or after Nicaea, they have a defect of reason, in other words, they're stupid. Uh, <laughs> and Jewish malignity, this is all in reference to the Shema, right? Uh, it's quite amazing. So that is the immortal one. So now, so what? Well, so what is that, well, one of the main takeaways here is that uh, how Christianity banned Christ. So we look at the evil Greco-Roman, at the bad pagan world, right? And look how wonderful Christianity won out. Christianity won out, but actually it's a happy medium. It's a happy medium. That's a quote from Wolfson. That's an excellent book, Philosophy of the Church Fathers. Uh, Pastor? Church Fathers' conception of the Trinity was a combination of Jewish monotheism and pagan polytheism, 
except that to them this combination was a good combination. And consequently, they gloried in it and pointed to it as evidence of their belief. The truth passes in the mean, the middle, between these two conceptions, destroying each heresy and yet accepting what is useful to it from each. The Jewish dogma is destroyed. On the one hand, of the Jewish idea, we have the unity of God's nature, and on the other, of the Greek, we have the distinction of hypostases. And then, go ahead. The Holy Fathers assembled with the Holy Ghost in Nicaea, and those who shall dare to introduce a different faith, whether from heathenism or from Judaism, shall be anathematized. That's a uh, damned. <laughs> Uh, Ipostasis persons, right? So you need uh, three distinct different persons. So it's a combination. This was in uh, a Br British man, Wolfson, I believe, Harvard, 1950s. A very, you know, reputable evangelical guy. So it's a combination of Jewish monotheism, but a happy medium. Happy in their little world of, right? And I love this quote, right? If you love history, you gotta love this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> the Holy Fathers assembled with the Holy Ghost in Nicaea. All right, uh, this is a, a, a very interesting, this is from an excellent book which is free, uh, free once again, free online, just Google, Eric Chang. He was uh, from Hong Kong, I believe, uh, a man who established various churches in China, Canada, in Hong Kong proper. Uh, he's dead now, but he left us this incredible book, highly recommend, The Only True God. Uh, Danny, please. As Trinitarians, we closed our eyes and ears to the fact that which should have been perfectly obvious, that there are three gods. So how do we manage to maintain that we still believe in one God? There was only one way. The definition of the word God had to be changed from person to a divine substance or nature in which the three persons share equally. The fact is that Trinitarian monotheism can only qualify as monotheism by changing the definition of the word monotheism. It's rather like saying that an angel is a human being by changing the meaning of the term human being to include angels and vice versa. I love that last statement, by the way. Uh, take heed. A lot of our Unitarian friends, just because you're Unitarian, doesn't mean we're, we're there. I think there's more study to do, but it's a changing meaning. Uh, Anthony puts it well. If you, if you know soccer, is it soccer in this country? Uh, football in Europe? Uh, you, you move the goalpost. So where, where am I going to put the ball? The, you keep moving the, the uh, goalposts, right? So you're. It's, I, I call it a slippery fish uh, theory, the Trinity. It's slippery. It's, it's a spectrum. It's a spectrum to me. Uh, it's a spectrum. So you got tritheism, three gods, right? Which is really, by definition, what the doctrine is. It's, it's tritheism because they have one what? The one being, three persons in one being, the being is a what? Really, it's an essence, it's a nature, and three distinct separate persons share it. That, that's tritheism, really. So it's a spectrum between that, or others, as uh, Professor Tuggy, they, they, they move the goalpost. The spectrum changes to really modalism. No, no, it's a, we don't, no, we're not tritheists. Uh, sorry? Yeah, you're right. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> No, no, yeah. The, again, it just, it depends uh, who, who you're dealing with. So. Uh, so to wrap up here, how are we doing? So what? So who? <laughs> uh, this mystery all, the immortal die, said, uh, what was his face, uh, Edward? Um, that? Wesley. Wesley, sorry. This mystery all, the immortal dies. This, I don't know if you can see them, An Anselm of Canterbury. Uh, Danny, please. It's good for every person to believe in an indescribable trinity, one and a unity because of one essence, triune and a trinity because of its three somethings. Three? I don't know what. 
Yet one cannot in one word show why they are three. Pastor Seth? The truth that God is three and one is altogether a matter of faith, and in no way can it be demonstratively proved. St. Thomas Aquinas, in case you can't see that. So, yeah, uh, very honest people there. Uh, more, a little bit more just to wrap up. Orthodox confessions, I call it. Uh, Danny, can you do the Lewis, please? At this point, we must remind ourselves that Christian theology doesn't believe God to be a person. It believes him to be such that in him, a trinity of persons is consistent with a unity of deity. In that sense, it believes him to be just as a cube, in which six squares are consistent with unity of the body, is different from a square. C.S. Lewis. I see a lot of our people, by the way, quoting C.S. Lewis, which is fine. You know, you take the good, throw away the bad. But uh, here I'm exposing, obviously, um, a honest uh, uh, Christian. Christian theology does not believe God to be a person. Just say, it. just you know, let's be honest with each other, so we can have an honest dialogue. I cannot. We cannot have an honest dialogue if you can't define for me what you believe, as Professor Tuggy put it. Uh, James White once again. Prove that. You can't have an honest dialogue. They keep moving in the spectrum of the Trinity, what I call the spectrum of the Trinity. Uh, Bowman, is it Matt Bowman? Uh, no, not that's the Rob, ro Robert. rugby player. <laughs> Rob Bowman, why you should believe in the Trinity? God may be, may be described as one person, oh, okay, or as three persons, Oh, depending on the meaning of persons. We, I, I can't, we can't have a conversation, honest conversation. I can't, right? So the best we can hope to do in, in dialogue and debates, if you go out there as a debater, as an apologist for the Unitarian monotheistic faith, is at least expose them for what they are. Uh, balderdash, hogwash, uh, so here's Mr. White, uh, is it Pastor said? Hank Hanegraaff has often <coughs> expressed this point in a wonderfully simple and clear way. When speaking of the Trinity, we need to realize that we're talking about one what and three who's. What? <laughs> who, who, who? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. First base. <laughs> well, you guys don't seem to think this is simple and clear. <laughs> simple and clear. <laughs> Millard Erickson, who's a very honest, uh, you know, a uniformly honest uh, evangelical in his book, God in Three Persons. Uh, Danny? If you... It may also be necessary <coughs> in order to convey the unusual meaning involved in this doctrine to utilize what analytical philosophers would term logically odd language. This means using language in such a way as intentionally to commit grammatical errors. <laughs> Thus, I have sometimes said of the Trinity, he are three, or they is one. <laughs> intentionally. Uh, Yauka from Netherlands. Where are you, brother? Back there. You know, you're right in one sense, as we have spoken a lot about, but in others we have to obviously um, be wise in our <laughs> right approach. <clears throat> but that's very troubling, isn't it? Isn't that troubling? Intention. You know, when Jesus said there is only one who is good, wink, wink, me, <laughs> right? You know what I mean? There's only one who is good. What's wrong with you? Wink, wink. You know, like, he probably is hand behind me. Yeah. You know, they, this is troubling, right? We, we must be honest uh, with ourselves here. So, uh, just, you will be made to care. I hope by now, I hope by now you have been made to care. Uh, I'll finish with Lant Carpenter, not very well known. 
He was an English educator, Unitarian minister. I love this quote. If God is tripersonal, it cannot be said, it, note, it's an it, cannot be said to be a person, a who. You introduce nothing but confusion, for God is always described by the sacred writers as a person. When you speak of God being an intelligent agent, and at the same time deny him to be a person, you talk in a language not possible to be understood. Again, whether the terms essence and substance have the same signification, meaning, or different things, they mean different things, I think of little importance and not worth a particular discussion. It is high time that all such metaphysical terms should be banished from Christian professions and Christian debates. Hallelujah. Amen. Joe, amen? Amen. <laughs> uh, last word, the orthodox corruption. Uh, Danny, please. The doctrines of the Logos and the Trinity received their shape from Greek fathers who, if not trained in the schools, were much influenced directly or indirectly by the Platonic philosophy, particularly in its Jewish Alexandrian form. That errors and corruptions crept into the church from this source cannot be denied. Among the most illustrious of the fathers who were more or less Platonic, we may name Justin Martyr, Athenagoras, <coughs> Theophilus, Irenaeus, Hippolytus, Clement of Alexandria, Origen, Minucius, Felix, Felix. Eusebius. Yep. I'll, I'll spare you. I'll spare you the rest, Thank brother. <laughs> Basil, the great Gregory of Nyssa, and St. Augustine. Uh, I love that, right? That errors and corruptions crept into the church from this source cannot be denied. It's history. Uh, it's not fantasy. It's not when Professor Tyler is not making it up. This is uh, the new, is it Schaff Herzog? Encyclopedia of Religious Knowledge, 1957 there. And oh, I'll finish with Dr. Del Taggy. Excellent article, Trinity, uh, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. No theologian in the first three centuries was a Trinitarian in the sense of a believing that the one God is tripersonal, containing equally divine, quote, unquote, persons. So no one, really, in the first three cents. I hope you still <laughs> hold to that. I'm holding you to that. Um, all right, uh, recommended readings. Uh, this is, uh, like I said, this is Harry Wolfson. Philosophy of the Church Fathers, uh, Earliest Christian Confessions, Newfield, uh, Jewish Worship. Uh, this is about the ban, the Christian or Byzantine, it's called Byzantine, really, ban or prohibition, you can look it up as. Uh, again, uh, Jakob Mann, this is uh, pretty much the complete sort of history of the ban. Uh, well, complete insofar as all the Jewish, there's a lot of Jewish sources, medieval sources about the ban, but I'm still looking for Christian sources. There has to be. Changes in the divine service of the synagogue due to religious persecutions, and it's actually free online, I found this, PDF. Uh, it's only 60 pages or so, uh, only because these things are usually 400 pages. And uh, of course, my, the website, the human Jesus, thehumanjesus.org.